Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem and there is Johannes Keller and Oren Kirschenbaum. Today we'll talk about just intonation in the Renaissance. <laughs> When we play early music, we have some idea of which temperaments we should use according to the different styles. As you know, temperaments by definition contain internal imperfections and employ some impure intervals. However, temperaments are only necessary for systems that have fixed pitches, or almost fixed pitches. But what about a cappella singing? Theoretically, one could be completely free of temperaments and use only pure intervals, just intonation if you wish. In this episode, We will check if such a thing is possible in the context of Renaissance polyphony and try to understand what our old colleagues from the 16th century might have done about it. The idea of singing a cappella music using only perfect intervals was probably there from the beginning. Zarlino presented it as the natural way things must go. This is as opposed to artificially trying to sing in a certain temperament. However, this natural way that he talks about is apparently not so clear and not so natural. Already in Zarlino's time some criticism arose, mainly advocating that when using only pure intervals in polyphony, the pitch would change along the performance. Since then, and until today, many have criticized the idea, but many others nevertheless try to find ways to understand both theoretically and practically how such a thing might work. Trying to be free of temperaments and have all the intervals pure, one quickly ends up with questions and problems. Let's try to experiment a bit with pure intervals, to get the feeling for it and to understand its difficulties. To do it, we will use a method that visualizes all the notes of a piece and their relation to each other. Since we are interested in pure relations only, all the connecting lines represent pure intervals, and each note can sound in any octave. Let's say that we want to have a pure C major chord. We start from C, then we take a pure fifth above it, G. Good, now we just need a third. As you know from our video about Renaissance tuning, if we'd continue with pure fifths until the E, we'll arrive at a Pythagorean third, which is way too high. We want a pure third. Such a third would be one syntonic comma lower. Here it is. Now it's pure with our C and we have a pure major chord. In a pure major chord hides yet another interval. In addition to the pure fifth and the pure major third, we have the pure minor third. You see that the G, a pure minor third above the E, is one level higher than the E. If we will try to make it in a Pythagorean way using only pure fifth, it will be too low by a syntonic comma. Therefore, if we'd want a pure minor third, we'll have to look for it one comma level higher. So, if we'd like to have now a C minor chord, we'd have to get our E flat one comma higher, here, That's basically it. We start with pure fifth, but then, in order to get pure minor and major thirds or sixth, we have to go one comma level up or down. Theoretically, it seems like a nice plan, but when applying it on real music, there are several problems. Problem number one. Using only pure intervals changes the pitch. To demonstrate that, let's take this short progression. We start with a D minor chord, D, A, D are all pure on level 0, and the minor third on the F, in order to be pure, must be on level plus 1. The next chord is based on this F, so all the notes, except the major third that should be relatively lower, are on level plus 1. From here we can go on in the same manner finding the next notes. Notice that the minor third above the G, the B flat, is already on level plus 2. 
now we want to go back to the same D minor chord we started with. But whoops! Using exclusively pure intervals, we arrived one comma higher than where we started. Let's listen. Let's try another one. Here we start on a F major chord, so we'll put F and C on level 0. The A, in order to be pure with F, must be of course on level minus 1. The second chord makes use of this A, therefore its bass must also be on level minus 1. We continue with two more chords in a similar way, and whoops! By using exclusively pure intervals, this time we find ourselves one comma lower than where we started. The migration of pitch may be in some cases a small problem, but in others a big one. If a small section turns out to migrate down one comma, as it is rather common, and this section is repeated, like in a strophic song for example, the pitch migration would be highly noticeable. Check the footnote for some examples. Problem number two. The melodic intervals are compromised. As the aim is to have all harmonic intervals pure, the melodic intervals are secondary and turn out to be in many cases alien and awkward to us. See for example this common cadential progression. Looking at the alto part, the closest B to C is located here, one level apart. This is the usual size of a diatonic semitone. However, if we consider the other intervals in this example, the semitone is forced to be stretched by one more comma in order to be pure with the D. Some would see it as a unique expressiveness that is added to otherwise simple melodies. But others would hear it as intervals that are simply out of tune. Problem number three, from theory to practice. Bringing these highly theoretical ideas that contain internal errors into reality, the human factor kicks in. The singers are required to have very accurate control over micro-intonation but the constant presence of human flaws takes us away from our goal of using only pure intervals. Depending on the acoustics, timbre, number of performers and other parameters, these flaws may be softened or intensified. Historically speaking, there are further problems. 1. There is neither historical terminology nor notation for the required variety of melodic intervals needed for just intonation. We do not know of a way that these things could have been communicated. If there was a widespread practice of just intonation, it did not leave any noticeable trace. 2. In order to prepare a just version of a piece, one must analyze its score. However, it is rather safe to say that scores were not a common tool for performers in the 16th and 17th centuries. Mostly individual part books were used. In modern times, many writers try to find ways to overcome the inherent problems of the system. They did it by using impure intervals at certain points and by modifying the pitch of certain notes while holding them. All these attempts were not only disregarding historical evidence, they also contradict the very idea of just intonation by using impure intervals. In other words, at least in the context of Renaissance polyphony, it seems that singers most probably did not apply just intonation. <coughs> what do we know about historical practices regarding intonation? While unaccompanied a cappella singing definitely took place throughout the 16th century, we do know that the addition of instruments was also very prominent. When singing along with instruments, 
be it an organ, lute, or a consort of viols, a certain temperament serves as the basis of the performance. Zarlino says that as the singers by nature will sing pure, there will be slight disagreements between them and the instruments. But on the whole, it is the best solution when playing together. If indeed singing with instruments was a norm, we can assume that singers must have acquired a certain starting point and memory of how things go. This might have included a steady tonic, as opposed to the migrating pitch of the just intonation, and the qualities of the different melodic intervals. Nicola Vicentino was obsessed with everything connected to tuning. He invented this special keyboard with no less than 36 keys per octave. Without getting into too many details, using his two-manual monster, one is able to have a lot of pure intervals. Similar to the modern just intonation theories, however, also here modifications are needed, but in fact much smaller ones. Vicentino offered himself to work with groups of singers for a month, after which, according to him, they will be able to sing very well also unaccompanied. Interestingly, not a few composers that dealt with highly chromatic madrigals, like Gesualdo, Luzzaschi, Mazzocchi and others, were interested and involved in one way or another with special chromatic keyboards. While it doesn't mean that their madrigals were performed with a keyboard, it might be that the composition as well as the performance and its preparation took inspiration from the chromatic instruments. And while Vicentino's crash course most probably does not represent a significant widespread practice or tradition, it does imply that by working with keyboards, singers can acquire certain norms that will allow them to sing as well also unaccompanied. Historically, while there is no evidence that singers were singing in certain temperaments, there is also no evidence that they try to sing in any kind of just intonation system. Similar to the field of temperaments, most of the evidence comes from the purely theoretical writings that have very little to do with practice. We suggested that singing with instruments, which are bound to certain temperaments, might be a place to start with, but unfortunately this seems like the only thing we can say at this point. We'll finish with a quote by Ercole Botrigari, who was very critical about the tuning between different kinds of instruments. In his book, the most forgiving description is of a group of singers from Padova, who sang some canzoni. He writes that their desire to sing in perfect union was so great that not only they constantly asked for advices from great maestri di cappella, they also never ceased to criticize each other most kindly about their own defects. Then, when singing, they delighted us in making as far as they could a true union of their respective voices, from which then came forth, I will say, an almost celestial harmony. From this quote we may learn that the best that we can do is merely almost good. Intonation is something which is not only difficult in practice, but also in theory. True just intonation is a forbidden fruit we are only allowed to dream of. So this was our show about just intonation, we hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. Feel free to comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.